much. Welcome to the ABCs of IEP, Thinking Beyond a Year at a Time. I am Angela McGuire. I'm the person that you should see on your left, the left-hand side of your screen. Um, that's me with my daughter, Cassidy, who is 27 now, which just shakes me to my core. Um, I am a <laughs> project director here at West Ed. I work primarily in um, early intervention services, so um, doing training and technical assistance for professionals who work with infants and toddlers with disabilities in their families, but have a long history in the entire uh, IEP process. Yep. Thanks. Um, I'm Debbie Benitez. I work in a different program than Angela does. I work in the Comprehensive School Assistance Program, um, and I am the Director of Research and Impact Assessment um, here in my program at West Ed. I am formerly a special education teacher. I do a lot of work currently in evaluating special education programs. Um, and a, a lot of K-12 uh, school reform work that also includes special education. Thank you. So this is a quick overview of what we have um, in this presentation. We really felt like um, that we should mention here that the scope of this webinar is really um, ambitious. <laughs> So our goal is to provide an overly simplified but comprehensive foundation uh, about the IEP process based on the needs that were identified for us by our neighbors, um, and then to open it up to discussion and questions. So within this uh, next hour or so, we're going to be talking about the bedrock principles of um, education, uh, special education and the IEP process. What is an IEP? Uh, talk about a couple of really important policy considerations. IEPs at transition, how they change, um, what some special considerations are there, and IEPs and assistive technology. Oops. So the bedrock principles, um, we, we really wanted to give you a foundation of, of the purposes and guiding principles of the IDEA. So, and that would be the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So many people don't know that prior to 1975, the educational needs of millions of children with disabilities weren't being fully met because many children with disabilities were excluded entirely from public schools. Children with disabilities who were in schools didn't receive appropriate educational services. Some children were in schools with undiagnosed disabilities and didn't have successful educational experiences, or the schools didn't have the resources to educate children with special educational needs. And families, if they have the means, had to find services outside of the public school system. But in 1975, uh, Congress enacted what was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, or as we knew it when I was in school, PL 94142. Public Law 94142, which was later reauthorized and updated as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, and that happened in 2004. And the purposes of IDEA are, um, and this is from the law, to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free, appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. So let's look a little bit closer at what um, each of those terms in free appropriate public education means. And uh, many times you'll hear people refer to that simply as FAPE. So capital F, capital A, capital P, capital E spells FAPE. It's not a, a fake word. It's a real, <laughs> well, it's an acronym, so it's not really a word. Um, but we, I want to break it down and look at what each of those letters stands for. So what is free education in FAPE? Well, federally funded programs must provide education and related services without cost to the person with a disability or his or her parents or guardians, except 
or fees that are equally imposed on non-disabled persons or their parents or guardians. And that's the terminology that's used um, in the law. So normally, um, when, I, when I would be speaking, I would say, except for fees equally imposed on students without disabilities um, or their parents or guardians. If a recipient is unable, a recipient being a district, if a district is unable to provide a free appropriate public education itself, then they may place a person with a disability in or refer that person to a program other than the one it operates. However, the district remains responsible for ensuring that education offered is appropriate and they cover the financial obligations associated with that placement. Well, that's what free means within the law. What is appropriate education under FAPE? Well, uh, an appropriate education will include education services that are designed to meet the individual education needs of students with disabilities as adequately as the needs of non-disabled students are met. The education of each student with a disability with non-disabled students to the maximum extent appropriate to the needs of the student with the disability. Appropriate education would include evaluation and placement procedures established to guard against misclassification or inappropriate placement of students and a periodic reevaluation of those placements in special education or related services and the establishment of due process procedures that enable parents and guardians to receive required notices, review their child's records, and challenge identification, evaluation, and placement decisions. What is public education? It means that it the education must be available to all children within a district's jurisdiction. So all qualified persons with disabilities living within a school district are entitled to FAPE. If a student is placed in a private school because the school district can't provide a free appropriate public education, the financial obligations for this placement are the responsibility of the district. However, if a school district makes available a free appropriate public education and the student's parents or guardians choose to place the child in a private school, then the district is not required to pay for that placement. If a recipient school district places a student with a disability in a program that requires the student to be away from home, the recipient is responsible for the cost of room and board and non-medical care. To meet the requirements of state, the district may place a student with a disability in or refer the student to a program that's not operated by them, but when this occurs, they must ensure that they have adequate transportation to access that placement and that the program um, is at no cost, no personal or family cost that would be um, subject to the student with a disability. What is education under FAPE? So education refers to any uh, education in regular classes, education in regular classes with the use of related aids and services, or special education related services in separate classrooms for all or portions of the day. Special education may include specially designed instruction in classrooms at home or, as we just mentioned, in private or public institutions, and may be accompanied by related services such as speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, psychological counseling, and medically, medical diagnostic services necessary to the child's education. Education services ensure that the, the programs um, meet the individual needs of an individualized education program that is developed for each student with a disability. So it's not just those services, they are specific to the needs of an individual student. And in order to accomplish that, they, 
there is a special process that is established, and that is the IEP process. And I'm going to turn it over to Deb to talk about what is in an IEP. Thanks, Angela. Um, so, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me okay, Angela? Yep. Okay, we just want to test my mic. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the IEP. The IEP stands for the Individualized Education Program. And this is the document that's developed for students who are found eligible for services, uh, special education services. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the sections of the IEP are and some of the processes. So the, the IEP has two general purposes for supporting students with disabilities. Um, the first is to establish measurable goals. So that's essentially to ensure that the school establishes goals for the students that, that are measurable and rigorous. And the second is to identify services and programs. And specifically, this is um, the requirement that the IEP needs to state the special education and the related services that the um, school will provide to the child. In terms of what's covered within the IEP, this is essentially the general education curriculum, any extracurricular activities, and any non-academic activities that the child would receive. And those would be, for example, other activities. So there are eight sections of the IEP, and each of them is critical to the success of the student. So it's important to keep in mind that the IDEA legislation that Angela was referring to um, requires that individuals who are responsible for students who have an IEP not only consider the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law as well. So the first section of the IEP is um, the current skill level of a student. And this is essentially the, the present levels of both academic and functional performance of the student. Also in this section, we're required to describe how the student's disability affects her involvement in or progress in the general education curriculum. The second is annual goals for the student. So this is what I mentioned earlier, statement of measurable annual goals, including academic and functional. The third is progress monitoring of the student. And this is a description of how the student's progress toward meeting those annual goals will be measured and when the periodic pro uh, reports will be provided. So this really is to instill in the team and um, anyone involved in services that this needs to be a rigorous process. The fourth is special education services for the student. So this is the types of services and, and related services, for example, supplementary aids, that the student's going to need. So the duration of services for the student, that's um, projected date for the beginning of the services, the modifications, and the anticipated frequency, location, duration of those, uh, of those services. The sixth section is uh, participation in the general education curriculum. Um, and this section requires an explanation of the extent to which the student will not participate with their peers without disabilities in regular classes. And that's essentially uh, what that looks like in practice is percentage, percentage of time in the general education classroom. The seventh section is the individual accommodations for testing. Um, so these are the accommodations that are necessary for the student to participate in statewide academic um, district uh, assessments, excuse me. Um, and the last section is the statement of transition for the student. And this is you know, transition as we know it um, into uh, post-secondary employment, 
uh, independent living and social and recreational living. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the process for developing the IEP so everyone has an idea of uh, what the student and families and, and uh, staff go through as part of this process. Um, IDEA requires that um, the process is as, as rigorous as possible, again, meeting the spirit and, and letter of the law. The first uh, element is the pre-referral process. And these are the activities that are employed to screen the students before a more formal identification procedure is implemented. Um, so in general, before any formal referral happens, uh, teachers and family members work together to see whether um, the educational or any of the behavioral challenges can be resolved in the general education classroom. That's really what we want to do first and foremost. So the second element is the referral process. So if the pre-referral intervention is not successful, the student is referred for special education services. And typically, this process, um, uh, sorry, as uh, this process begins sooner for children with um, severe dis dif disabilities because their disabilities are, are more obvious at birth or during infancy. So as children go, grow older, other signs often trigger referrals, like, for example, um, learning, dis learning disabilities, which you wouldn't see until later when a child begins to read. The third element is identification. Um, and the purpose of this step is to determine whether the student has a disability and whether special education is required and the types of services that are going to be needed. The fourth is eligibility. And for those students who have been identified, the IEP team then determines what components of the full range of special education services are needed so that an appropriate education can be planned and delivered. The next step is the development of the IEP. So obviously for those students who qualify for special education, this step requires that parents and the IEP team make decisions about the uh, pro appropriate education services and, and placement. The next step is the implementation of the IEP. So now, now this document lays out what constitutes an appropriate education for the student. Um, the extent to which the student is going to participate in the general education curriculum, the types of accommodations and modifications that are going to be necessary for success, and all an array of services that could be uh, provided to support the student in the educational program. And then finally, the evaluation reviews is the, um, is the element that calls for um, determining progress and seeing where the student is. So the evaluation frequently happens um, once a year and at least once every three years. Um, unless, of course, a parent or the district agree that um, an, an additional IEP or a reassessment is necessary. OK, Angel? Yeah. Great, thank you, Deb. So once the IEP is written and established, um, then there are some um, policy policies that kind of kick into place. I guess I should say that these policy considerations um, are, are things to keep in mind as the IEP is, is being developed. That would be a more accurate way to state that. So um, one of the first things to consider um, as a team is working through um, the IEP process is what's called the Least Restrictive Environment, or LRE for short. You'll often hear people saying, you know, what, what is the LRE for this child? Um, the LRE, this is how it's described in the regs, um, sorry, the Least Restrictive Environment is, means to the maximum extent appropriate children with disabilities are educated with children who are non-disabled and 
special classes, separate schooling, or other removal of children with disabilities from the regular education environment occurs only if the nature or severity of the disability is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. This is the wording directly from the regs. I broke it up um, a little bit to, just to make it a little more digestible with the uh, ellipses that you see on the slide. So to the maximum extent appropriate, educated with children who are not disabled. Uh, those are kind of the two key components here. So what does that look like practically? Well, um, this slide kind of spells out some, some do's and don'ts when you're thinking about um, the least restrictive, least restrictive environment for a child with a disability. It, and you can see why people say LRE is much easier. Um, so the, first of all, the, the place to start is the school that the student would have would attend if they had no disability. So that is kind of the default um, thinking when a team is working through where the education and special services will be delivered for this student. The next thing to think about, or equally equally important, is to base the placement decisions on the student's IEP. So what are the needs of that child and what are the uh, educational strategies that have been identified in the IEP and where are they best implemented that has that allows the, the child to have the most um, access to their community really, which is the school. And then consider the effective placement on the child or on the quality of services that are needed. The things not to consider or not to do when making a placement um, decision is to base that decision on the disability or label. So long time ago you would see, and hopefully you don't see any more um, classes that are for children with a specific type of disability. Um, I remember when my daughter was in grade school, there was a classroom called the Limited Learner Classroom, which just still makes, well, as you can hear, it still makes me laugh. Um, it, not an appropriate placement for any child to be in the Limited, limited Learner Classroom. You do not make a placement based on program categories. So what does that mean? A program category would be um, like, for instance, the special day class. So you don't decide that a, a child should be placed in a classroom or in a specific setting because that setting needs more kids placed in it to keep it running, basically. Um, and then the location of staff, availability of funding, or convenience of the district are not considerations when making a placement decision. LRE may be a variety of settings. It may be a variety of different settings for one child. Usually, um, the least restrictive environment is going to be a, a general education class or a special education class possibly a special education school. Sometimes the setting may be home. There are children who um, are homeschooled, who have IEPs, and that's perfectly legitimate. Um, there are children who maybe must be at home because of health considerations. Um, and that would be the same case that you would sometimes see a, uh, the LRE being the hospital or other public or private institution. The LRE might be um, regular public school or a magnet or a charter school. And we'll talk a little bit more about charter schools a little later on. Well, almost immediately. <laughs> um, or it could be a non-public school. So what's the difference between a non-public school and a private school? Well, a non-public school is privately operated but receives public funding to, uh, to provide faith to some children. 
So what about private schools? Well, we've already um, reviewed, and I'm, I'm happy to go over it again if needed, that if a district um, does not have the capacity to provide a free appropriate public education for a specific student, that they, the IEP team may decide that um, a private setting is more appropriate. But private schools do not receive funding um, under IDEA, and they are not required to provide a free appropriate public education um, or an IEP as public schools are. So if a family were to decide to um, place a child in a private school setting, then they do not have the same uh, kinds of planning and protections that a child would have if they were attending a public or publicly funded school. Private schools are bound by Section 504 um, of the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and so they cannot discriminate against a, a child or anyone with a disability for reasons related to that disability. And so, you know, they still need to be accessible. They still need to to um, to be as open as they would be if the person were otherwise qualified to attend that school. And they might be responsible for providing modifications, accommodations, and access to educational opportunities, so such as you know, a ramp or uh, for a child with a wheelchair. Public schools may still have responsibilities for children with disabilities who are enrolled in private schools. And typically, that's going to be um, determined by what um, are called MOUs, or uh, memorandums of understanding within um, a district. So for instance, when my daughter Cassidy was in kindergarten, or kindergarten aged, I guess I should say, um, she attended a Montessori school in our city. And that was a private school. But the district um, still retained the uh, obligation to provide FAPE for her. So she received um, special, uh, I'm sorry, speech therapy at a grade school that happened to be right next door to the Montessori school. And the staff at the Montessori school received special education consultation services with um, an early childhood special education professional from the district so that Cassidy could be successfully um, educated at the Montessori school. So what about charter schools? Well, charter schools, um, FAPE applies to all public schools, and charter schools, most charter schools, are public schools. So charter schools must follow all federal laws that apply to any other public school. But how they do that will, different, or will differ based on their charter. So some charter schools are districts. Um, and under state law, they would be required, under California state law, they would be required to provide special education services like any other district does. So if they're receiving funding from the district, a portion of that would need to be accessed to provide the special education services for the children that are attending that charter school. <coughs> Some charter schools, I think most charter schools, are part of a district. So they have to follow district policy, and special education services are provided to students at that charter by the district, like any other school. So it's, it's not quite the same as that um, private um, school within the district that I just described, the Montessori school. They were not a charter school, but they had uh, an agreement with the district um, as far as children who required special education services that were um, attending their school. Um, it's, a little, it's a little bit different because that charter school is actually seen as just another school within the district, and they have access to all of the special education services that any other public school would within that district. The other critical policy consideration for um, IEP development is parent participation or parent involvement. Um, you, you hear a lot about uh, family engagement, family involvement, parental involvement, parent participation. Under IDEA, there are very specific requirements for um, parent involvement in the IEP process. 
And when I say the IEP process, I mean throughout a child's uh, experience, <laughs> educational experience. So parents have the right to participate in any meetings and decisions about evaluation, identification, and placement of their child. They may participate in, must participate in, uh, meetings and decisions about FAPE for their child and the development, review, and revision of their child's IEP. They must be notified in writing prior to the district initiating or refusing to initiate or take actions on eligibility, evaluation, placement, or anything else regarded under FAPE. And they must provide consent at specific um, points uh, along the way um, before initiating or reevaluating um, a child for services and before services begin. And that prior written notice that parents receive needs to include um, a statement that the parents have protection under IDEA's procedural safeguards and it must let parents know where they can obtain a description of those safeguards. And there is a list, a very long list in very small type that you can get from um, the California Department of Education or from any district um, in California. The requirements for written notice are that they must be understandable to the general public. They should include a statement about procedural safeguards for parents. They must be in the parent's native language or mode of communication used by the parent unless it's clearly not feasible to do so. And if the parent's mode of communication is not a written language, uh, the written notice must be translated um, orally or by other means. The district must ensure that the parent understands the notice and they should document that the notice requirements have been met. So those are all the uh, stated requirements for um, parent participation. But I think what's really key to remember is that I, IEP teams change from year to year, but the family is constant um, in the child's life. And so forging a productive and cooperative relationship with the student's family supports not just the student, but also the professionals that are working with the student. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over back over to Deb at this point, and we're going to talk about transition. Okay, great. Um, so the the transition section of the IEP or, or the ITP, and that stands for the Individual Transition Plan, um, that's the section that has a very specific meaning. And it essentially defines the move from high school to adult life. Um, there are essentially four areas of focus during the transition process. And they are post-secondary education, so college or training. And by college, I mean either courses you're taking towards graduation or just independent courses that you're taking because you're interested or, or the student um, um, needs it for something. The second area is meaningful employment. The third is independent living. And the fourth is the social and recreational activities. So what does the law require? Um, transition services are required by the student's 16th birthday. And it's recommended that the services begin no later than age, or that they start planning no later than age 15. I know there are some districts in California that start planning um, at 14. And I've um, known districts who, during middle school, will start um, very broadly, very generally planning for transition. Um, within the transition plan, there's still an academic focus, but the, the letter and the spirit of the law are meant to capture so much more for the student. The law requires that the plan is focused on um, improving both academic and functional achievement to facilitate movement from school to post-school activities. It requires that it's uh, the ITP is based on the student's strengths and interests. Um, that it includes inst 
uh, instruction related services, community experience, uh, development of employment, and other post school living objectives. And finally, it mandates the development of a plan that summarizes the student's skills, uh, strength, transition readiness, and needs. So the transition plan is basically a way of ensuring that um, the academic focus is broadened beyond what the student's life will look like after high school. So let's talk a little bit about what's expected. Um, during the IEP, the team should be identifying and recognizing um, the student's vision for his or her uh, hopes and dreams, interests. The team should discuss the student's uh, current performance, in other words, what the student is currently doing both academically and functionally that they identify age-appropriate measurable goals. Um, and again, it's important that these goals are based on the student's vision for herself or himself. Um, establish services that are designed to build on the student's strength, to identify accommodations for the student, um, and finally, to define each transition activity on the IEP um, regarding essentially who's responsible for the activity to support the student and when the activity will, will start and end. And again, this is to ensure that the team is responsible and accountable for, for following through. Um, so this last bullet is important because we essentially want to ensure that the students with disabilities when they're leaving high school, that they've met their goals. Because um, if any of you have supported students outside of high school who, or who have exited the system, um, it's, it's easy to write, and they, for example, um, that the student will build a particular skill. But it's really important that the IEP team measure that school and make sure that there has been progress toward that skill because um, if you think about it, after the IDEA requirements, nobody, you know, employers won't be measuring uh, goals, uh, colleges won't be measuring goals, so it's really incumbent on the um, IEP team to ensure that the student is ready for what comes after high school. So let's talk a little bit about who should be at the meeting. Um, typically, uh, the meeting includes the students, the core IEP team members, um, parents, additional educators, general educators, um, and administrators, like uh, local education agency staff or administration, district administration. But oftentimes what we see is there are individuals who are overlooked, and those are community professionals. So for example, um, a professional who is helping um, gain the student gain meaningful employment, other outside agencies, um, and, service pro and, and related service providers. So um, sometimes you know, speech therapist or the occupational therapist um, is not included, and um, what we know about this is it's really important to have everyone who supports a student at the actual transition IEP meeting. Um, this the last uh, slide that I'm talking about is about self-advocacy and self-determination. And it's really about professionals shifting expectations away from um, the students who are um, individuals who are uh, where professionals make decisions for them to individuals who are able to self-advocate and who are self-determined. So um, it's important to provide instruction and support that leads to very strong advocacy and self-determination skills. And the IEP process itself can be a learning 
um, and teaching experience in self-advocacy and self-determination. So you can bring those elements into IEP meetings. Um, but specifically, self-determination is the ability and opportunity for ind individuals with disabilities to make choices for themselves and exercise the kind of control that they want. So um, I, I think probably all of you know this, but um, self-determination doesn't mean that you do everything on your own or that you are completely independent, but it could mean choosing the types of services that you want for your life. Okay, I'm going to pass this back over to Angela. Keep tossing it back and forth. That's good. So um, <clears throat> we're going to take a little shift over to uh, discuss a little bit about IEPs and assistive technology. So um, specifically, what are the requirements and options for assistive technology um, through the IEP process? So the federal regulations describing the consideration of special factors that IEP teams undertake in the development of an IEP state that the IEP team must consider whether the child or student needs assistive technology devices and services. So to go a little deeper, um, the requirements say that uh, assistive technology devices or services or both must be made available if required in a child's IEP as part of special education related services or supplementary aids and services. And on a case-by-case -case basis, any school purchased assistive technology devices must be allowed to be used in a child's home or in other settings if the child needs those devices in order to receive FAPE, so free appropriate public education. Um, and, and that's, when you see FAPE popping up over and over again, that's why we opened with FAPE. It really is the kind of the, the ground floor for all decisions and um, services that are provided. So what do we mean by um, devices and services. Well, um, assistive technology devices are items, pieces of equipment, a product system that's acquired commercially off the shelf or modified or customized that increases, maintains, or improves the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. It does not include a medical device that is surgically implanted or the replacement of such a device. And um, services directly assist in the selection, acquisition, or use of an assistive technology device. So that would include evaluation to determine um, whether a child needs assistive technology or what assistive technology would be appropriate. The selection, design, fitting, customization, adaptation, all of those things you see listed there, maintenance, repair, <laughs> or replacement of devices. Coordination with therapies, interventions, and other services. So um, integrating the use of those devices into the basically daily educational routines of the child. Um, and training and technical assistance for the student, family, and professionals around the use of those assistive technology devices. Two important terms that are related to assistive technology that you may or may not be familiar with, um, are universal design for learning, so UDL um, is another way that you will hear that talked about. Um, and that refers to materials and technologies that are designed to accommodate a wide range of individuals, including those with disabilities. And the idea is that if a classroom, for instance, um, is organized around uh, UDL principles or universal design for learning principles that any person that enters that classroom would be able to um, access the activities there. That's kind of a shorthand, uh, more practical kind of definition of UDL. And then NEMAS, um, N-I-M-A-S, 
National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard. So this is um, a set of, of standards that um, says that instructional materials are, uh, are or must be designed to be accessible to blind persons or other persons with print disabilities. And there's a um, clearinghouse uh, that, where you can access um, materials and where you can access the standards that describe how to make materials that are accessible. Um, and specialized formats include such things as Braille, audio, and, uh, and digital text for people who are who have visual impairments. Assistive technology options are vast. They can be low-tech, low-cost, and they can be high-tech and high-end. Um, the low-tech options that um, are, are things that, or could be things that are used um, every day, but used in new ways. So for instance, a common uh, kitchen step stool is pictured here, could be used to provide stability for um, a child who has low muscle tone and is maybe smaller, you know, shorter legs to sit in a regular chair in a typical classroom. Or a high-tech option might be something um, like a sophisticated device that's specially designed to accomplish a very specific activity effectively. So special apps um, that are available for purchase for smartphones and uh, personal devices to facilitate communication would be an example of that. Also, you should keep in mind that there are likely multiple good solutions for any one challenge. So um, be open and creative when considering what kind of assistive technology uh, might be implemented. It might be more effective to go for something that is has a lower profile uh, and less, less shiny. <laughs> um, and kind of can go under the radar if you're looking to uh, to have a more inclusive kind of experience for a student um, rather than something that requires a lot of uh, intervention and support to be able to use it um, and that might interfere with relationships. So if we look at um, some kind of category categories of assistive technology, I put just a few in um, a, a few lists here because really it is daunting to try to think of listing all kinds of um, assistive technology that might be available or, or um, integrated into an IEP. So generics, um, in my mind, those refer to the commonly used um, strategies by just about anyone. Um, that can be supportive of students with disabilities. So calculators, pretty, I, I use a calculator at least every other day, but um, students with disabilities could benefit from using calculators instead, or in, in addition. Built-in accessibility features, just about everything that we own in our homes has some kind of accessibility feature. Your TV, you know, you can turn on the closed captioning, um, you can make um, the, the um, text on your computer much larger, those sorts of things. Headphones, everybody uses headphones or earbuds um, these days, so um, those would be an example of a generic kind of assistive technology. Magnifiers, straws and travel cups. Um, Cassidy uses a straw to drink and, you know, most of us do, but she really does need a straw to be able to, to uh, drink comfortably just something that is easily uh, available to most of us. High contrast text, so black on yellow, black on white, um, white on black, that, that would be high contrast text that's easier to see. Special lighting, um, that could include um, no fluorescent lighting. That might be um, kind of a, an adaptation for uh, people who are sensitive to um, certain kinds of lighting. Modifications and adaptations, those are changes or additions to equipment, materials, or environments that most people use, but they're made to support people with a variety of type and intensity of needs. So grip pads would be those uh, kind of rubbery little thin mats that you can use to keep things from slipping around. So for people with um, movement issues, it makes things a little bit more stable um, for them to use. Adjustable furniture, so I'm sitting in an adjustable chair right now. I can adjust the arms, the height, the, the tilt, whatever it is that I need to adjust so that it makes my uh, desk more comfortable. 
ergonomic keyboards. Ergo means ergonomic um, keyboards and ergonomic mice that make um, using a computer easier and more comfortable uh, for just about anyone. Pencil grips, those little rubbery uh, shapes that you can slide onto a pencil. Um, uh, many, uh, especially elementary school teachers, use them because they want you know kids to hold a pencil a certain way. But it also makes um, children with movement issues, um, it gives them a little bit uh, easier thing to grasp when they're learning to use a, a pencil or a crayon or a, um, a paintbrush. Weighted blankets and vests. Those, um, so I put, I put this on the list because uh, for some um, children with kind of uh, sensory processing um, issues, just having a, a little bit of extra weight on them can help them kind of center themselves and they're more able to participate in regular classroom activities like circle time or sitting at their desk um, or whatever that activity is. Ramps are uh, modifications to an environment that allow people who use uh, wheelchairs to be able to get up and down, in and out. Accessible te textbooks um, are another um, adaptation of a regular textbook, so you're not really changing the contents of the textbook, you're changing the way that you get into it. Um, although, it, yeah, that would be it. Captions, um, captions, I, I'm sure you're, some of you are using captions right now as you're viewing this um, presentation. And then actual equipment would be specially designed solutions for specific needs or activities. So walkers and wheelchairs for people who, um, who need that kind of support railings and grab bars for people maybe who have some um, balance issues. Uh, computers, tablets, and personal devices, which most of us use every day. They can also be equipment for communication, um, uh, for um, accessing um, information, so outgoing information as well as incoming information. Switches and other controls, um, they're really I think advancing quite a lot. Switches can be things that are actual uh, levers that um, are attached to some other piece of equipment that needs to be moved that uh, somebody can use to make indicate that that movement needs to be made for them. It could be something that they work with their hands. It could be something that someone works with their eyes or, or the motion of their head. Um, Communication boards and systems, uh, they are specially made uh, just for that um, activity or, as I said earlier, you can get apps that will turn a phone or a laptop or a, a personal device into a communication system. Screen readers, again, many of you um, are, are familiar with these or maybe using them now as you're accessing um, things on the internet and most um, computers now you can set to uh, use an internal screen reader and Braille writers. I have a friend who uh, reads and writes Braille and he has a Braille writer that he, um, interestingly enough, could take with him to some of his classes in high school but not others. So um, those are just a few of the examples of assistive technology that might be considered when constructing an IEP. So Deb and I had a very uh, challenging, I think, time when we were putting this, this presentation together for you because yes. there's so much to know <laughs> about the IEP process and uh, the ins and outs and the, uh, I don't know what, do's and don'ts, tips and tricks, I don't know. So we wanted to allow a lot of time for questions and I certainly hope that some people do have some questions. So um, we're going to open it up, I think, to the group and watch the chat for testing. Who is responsible for training, say, on an iPad with special apps? And that is from Jim is at Spencer in Santa Barbara. So, um, and Deb, you can jump in too, but I would say that um, it, the responsibility part would depend on how it is written in the IEP. So mm -hmm. if, um, if the IEP team has established that a specific app 
on an iPad is what someone is going to use for that, for the communication and certainly to access the um, free appropriate public education, then the school district would need to identify um, an assistive technology specialist that could assist with that. Now, if it's just something that, you know, the, the family has decided that they're going to try out, then that would be up to the, the family, I would suppose. Deb, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, no, I, I think, um, again, it really goes back to how it's written in the IEP. So we have another question related to AT. So what are some of the available funding sources for the AT needed for an IEP? Um, Again, I would uh, answer that that depends on what is written in the IEP and what the AT is, but really uh, it's the same as the funding source for any of the services that are written into an IEP, no different from any other service. So mm -hmm. um, your special education funding at your district. Right, and and I think um, as Angela and I were talking about this, one of the things that we kept going back to was the idea of um, the, indiv the individualized education program. And so what that means is the IEP team, by the, by the letter and the spirit of the law, should not be constrained by what the district has. So in other words, if a child needs AT devices that um, are more high-tech, high-end, um, to, to learn and to um, reach goals, then the, um, you know, the, the agency is responsible for identifying that. Um, thanks for that question. I have to see who was that. Michelle. Thomas is asking, are students given hands-on demonstrations of AT devices during the evaluation? So I have not um, participated in an evaluation as far as, you know, trying out different devices. I do know that there are special projects that are um, operating in the state that probably could provide those kinds of hands-on demonstrations. So you'd want to do a, a search for something like that. It seems to me that if you're considering a specific kind of device for a specific child that you would definitely want to have, um, if not that actual device, something really similar so that you can see how they interact with it. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd say that would be good practice. <laughs> Emily is asking, can an IEP be changed mid-school year if they are finding that the accommodations aren't working for the student? I'm happy to take that, or Deb, if you want to. I don't want to Go hold ahead. it. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes, an IEP can be changed mid-school year um, if things aren't working. So um, one thing that parents um, should always keep in mind is that they can always request an IEP meeting. And I believe the timeline, once they've made that request, is something like 30 days or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, if, if the team, if the education team, let's, let's flip this a little bit, if the education team um, has been using something and they don't think it's working, they can't just indiscriminately change what they're doing um, without convening that team, including the parents, and figuring out why it's not working. So I, I, I hope that's kind of answering the question. You can't discontinue or change anything that the IEP has put in place uh, just because you don't like it, <laughs> you don't think it's effective. You're welcome, Emily. Good. Any other questions? Okay. I like those kinds of questions.
Well, well uh, the other thing is you can always reach out to us um, at, at West Ed and, and Dylan McGuire, Debbie Benitez, uh, if you can have other questions that you think of. What can, a, what, can a, <laughs> what can a parent do if they object to a decision the team makes during the meeting? Well, there's a few things you can do. So a parent can, um, first of all, no services can start without the parent's consent. So if a parent disagrees with some decisions that are in the IEP team or IEP and they agree with some others, they can give consent for um, some of those services to start and let them know that they disagree or, uh, with the others and, and then that piece can be carried forward. Um, if they, um, one of the things that I recommend and that I regularly did was uh, at, at the end of the meeting, when it's time to sign everything, I would just say um, that I needed, it depended on who was at the meeting, I would either say I needed to take the IEP, the IEP back to my husband and um, review it with him and make sure that we're in agreement and then we would sign it. Um, or um, I would just say if he was with me, we would just say, you know, we, we want to think about this for a few days before we sign it. And I never had anybody tell me that, um, that I couldn't. So, and I didn't like keep it forever. I just kept it maybe for a day or two um, to consider. But it's a good idea to, to just think through everything um, that has been discussed and planned and make sure that you do agree with it. So if, if there is definitely an objection, you can either not provide consent for services to begin or you can provide consent for some to begin and not for others while that is all um, straightened out. Anything else, Deb? Nope. Yep. Is there a makeup clause in an IEP for a student who has fallen behind? Hmm. Oh, you mean like to make up work that has been missed in class? Something like that? Is that what you mean, Jim? Or do you mean like if a student is, let's say, functioning at, I don't know, let's say the fifth grade level um, and you want them to be functioning at the tenth grade level. What are we talking about here? A year behind in math. Okay, so I'm not sure what you mean by a makeup clause. So, uh, no, <laughs> I think we can, we can say no. There is not a, yeah. a makeup clause. <laughs> but um, I think it's really um, important to establish what the goals are, what the expectations are, and what um, is is realistic. So, depending on what um, the needs of that student are, uh, you can certainly write goals, and Deb's a uh, whiz at goal writing, <laughs> that would, um, you know, take that into account, and then you need to think about the strategies that will get the student where they want to be um, by the end of a certain time. But there's no kind of ramifications like if the student doesn't make it up by this time, you know, something bad's going to happen to either them or to the district. Um, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to remember that, you know, the entire time the, the uh, teachers should be um, engaging in formative and summative assessments and monitoring progress. So you, theoretically, you should never get so far that um, you realize that, uh, that a second student is very far behind. Um, those those um, measurements and the metrics to monitor progress are put in place to help guide whether or not you have to make a course correction or whether or not something else is needed in addition, um, that type of thing. I, this is such an interesting question. Thank you, Jim, because I'm thinking about um, so looking at math. When you have a student who's maybe got some more space in between their, their um, capacity and the capacity of their classmates, 
and the general mm -hmm. curriculum um, kind of expectations. I think you really need to look at what is the the end goal or the purpose of them participating in this curriculum. So, for instance, um, if you've got a, a child who's still working on understanding numberness and addition, maybe, and subtraction, and they're in the fifth or sixth grade and kids are working on multiplication, then is it, you know, what do you want to focus on? Do you want to help them learn how to use a calculator when they see the, the multiplication sign so that they can be working on that? Or do you want to work on them understanding the, um, the, the operations as they're kind of getting more and more complicated, or both, but they're both very, those are very different goals. And um, my experience with um, the IEP teams and classroom, general education classroom teachers in particular, when um, Cassie was growing up was their expectations were really high on themselves to bring her up to, to um, you know, grade level, which really wasn't at all what the goal was for her. So um, those discussions with among the IEP team members about what are the goals and what is the capacity of the student and what is the end goal were really important. So this title of our presentation, Thinking Beyond a Year at a Time, um, that really is important. Um, when the education team is changing from year to year, if you have a family or an administrator um, who is you know, involved over several years, <laughs> that's really great because they can um, better kind of um, communicate what the overall goal is for that student to those team members that are kind of coming in and out so everybody's on the same page and understands what's important and what's less important. Can you briefly describe the difference between a 504 plan and an IEP? Do you want it or do you want me to take it down? Um, go ahead. We're not in the same room, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So 504 plan is, um, is really a, a, it's an accessibility kind of um, issue. So. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone who has uh, a disability um, could have a 504 plan, but not everybody with a disability necessarily needs an IEP. An IEP is for a person with a disability whose, whose disability is really um, impacting their, uh, their ability to kind of act, uh, to, to participate in um, their education, so they need these extra um, specialized kind of um, services and supports and strategies. Uh, 504 plan is more about access. So maybe the, the student doesn't have the delays um, or the, the, the challenges in um, kind of understanding or um, performing um, up to grade level or expectations. Um, in the general education curriculum, but they have some um, issues that um, require some consideration. So for instance, um, many times a, a 504 plan will be for a student who maybe has some medical issues, so they're going to be out a lot. Um, so they might need um, teachers to understand that um, they're going to need some extra time to complete, uh, you know, projects or something like that. Or for students who have um, attention um, issues, they might need a quiet place to take a test. They don't need a different uh, set of expectations as far as the actual academics are concerned, but they need to be in a place where the distractions are you know, limited so that they can fully concentrate on what it is that they're doing. So those types of things would be written up in a 504 plan. So again, everybody that comes in contact with that child um, understands 
what kinds of accommodations they need in order to be able to um, be educated in, in their classroom. Does that help? Get that question a lot, okay? Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. We've been doing a lot with 508 compliance lately, or lately, you know, over the last few years with our projects. So I, for some reason, it just helps me to think, when I see 50 any number, <laughs> it's an accessibility uh, support or issue. Right. right. In, in, historically, the 504 was born out of, um, it's a larger uh, social or civil civil rights yeah. Law. Law. Are there other questions for us? Okay, I guess if there's there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So unless you guys have anything else, um Debbie or Angela? It's a great presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. We are easily found on the West Ed website. So uh, yeah. our emails are not um, on the presentation, I just realized. But um, you can easily find us on the website. <laughs> great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.